Good afternoon. We're going to continue talking about nucleic acid synthesis of viruses. Last time, before last, we talked about RNA-dependent RNA synthesis. Today, we're going to talk about DNA-dependent RNA synthesis, a process we call transcription. And this is, in many ways, different from what we talked about last time, in many ways similar, as you will see. We're also going to talk about RNA processing. This involves capping, polyadenylation, splicing, and those activities, of course, are in common with RNA viruses as well. So here is what we're going to do today. Transcription is a very specific word, in my view. It's shown on this slide. Here we have the Baltimore scheme again. We have our mRNA in the middle. Transcription is the production of mRNA from a double-stranded DNA template. Now, many people call any kind of mRNA synthesis transcription, whether it be a DNA or an RNA template, they can do what they want. For me, this is transcription, DNA to RNA. So the viruses we're going to talk about today are in red. We're going to talk about viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes. They have to make mRNA. Adenoviruses, herpes simplex virus, polyoma viruses. We're going to talk about hepatitis B virus. Very briefly, we're going to hit that one in another lecture entirely. Uh, we're going to talk about parvoviruses very briefly again. Uh, and a little bit about retroviruses. Even though these are RNA viruses, they make a DNA copy of their genome, and that DNA undergoes transcription to make messenger RNAs. All right, so those are the viruses we will talk about in terms of transcription. Now, the cell, of course, has enzymes. Our cells have enzymes that do transcription. Uh, they are, these are called DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, or just RNA Paul 1, 2, and 3. There are three different enzymes in our cells that do three different things in terms of making RNA from DNA templates. Paul 1 uh, makes ribosomal RNA. Uh, as far as we know, this polymerase is never used for any viral template. Paul 2 is the one we're going to mostly concern our, ourselves with today. Uh, this is the enzyme that makes pre-mRNA for our cells, and it also does it for many different viruses. It also happens to be the enzyme that makes the primary microRNA transcripts, which get processed. We're not going to talk about those today. Is that, those are for both cells and viruses, uh, small nuclear RNAs. And uh, a virus we'll talk about later, hepatitis delta virus genome is replicated by that. And then Paul 3 makes tRNAs and some ribosomal RNAs uh, for the cell. And we know some viruses, actually, that have part of their genome copied by Paul 3 to make very small RNAs, which we'll talk about later on. Here's, here's something that will help you remember what's going on here. This statement at the bottom, only DNA viruses that replicate in the cytoplasm encode an RNA polymerase, a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So pox viruses are one giant, all the giant viruses we talked about, the Mimi viruses, Pandora viruses, et cetera, uh, they replicate in the cytoplasm, and they have to encode their own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase because the cell doesn't have one there. It's all in the nucleus. Most of the viruses we're going to talk about today, in fact, replicate in the nucleus, and they utilize cellular RNA polymerase. They don't encode their own. But the big viruses have to because they don't go in the nucleus. They stay away, therefore they have to encode their own RNA polymerase. Here is another key factoid for you. If you remember this, really make your life easier. Transcription is the first biosynthetic event to occur in cells infected with double-stranded DNA viruses. Really important statement. Biosynthetic, and I'll tell you in a moment why I say that, Double-stranded DNA viruses. Uh, in other words, here's an illustration of uh, a life cycle of a polyomavirus. And this virus binds to a receptor. It's getting taken into the cell. Its DNA, it's a double-stranded DNA virus, gets into the nucleus. You can see it's step five there. It's in the nucleus. The first thing that happens is transcription, and mRNA is made. So that's the first thing that happens for double-stranded DNA viruses. No matter which one, uh, it has to make an mRNA. We're going to find out why 
at the end of this session today. But just remember that. And now the wording is very important. Biosynthetic event or biosynthetic reaction and double-stranded DNA viruses. Because you know, there are other viruses that don't have really double-stranded DNA genomes. The double-stranded DNA viruses include adenoviruses, herpes simplex, polyoma, papilloma, and many, many others that we don't talk about very much. They're not our model viruses. These other viruses aren't double-stranded. The parvoviruses are not double-stranded. The hepatitis B viruses are not double-stranded. The retroviruses are not anywhere close to being double-stranded. They're RNA. So they have to do other things. When they get to the double-stranded part of this scheme, then they make an mRNA. Let's look at this a little bit further. There are a couple of genomes of viruses we talk about, hepatina, parvo, retroviruses. They have to be converted to templates that are suitable for mRNA synthesis, that are suitable for transcription. The hepatina virus genome is partially double-stranded. It's got a gap. It's got a protein on the end. It's got a piece of RNA. There's just no, remember, the only thing that can be transcribed into mRNA is double-stranded DNA. So if you see something like that genome there, you know it's not working. What happens, this gets into cells, and it's repaired by repair enzymes. There are all kinds of enzymes in the cell that look at a piece of DNA and say, ah, there's something wrong with it, let's fix it. And they take off the protein and the RNA, they fill in the gap, and they repair it. Now it's double-stranded, and now it can serve that first biosynthetic event. Uh, the parvoviruses are single-stranded. They, they can't be transcribed to mRNA. So again, the cell repairs it to make a double-stranded copy, and then that can act as a template for mRNA synthesis. And finally, the retroviruses. We'll talk about them, uh, I think, next week. We, they are RNA genomes, of course, and they're copied to a double-stranded DNA, which integrates and then is suitable for transcription. And so here's the way to look at it. For all these quasi-double-stranded DNA templates, they have to be fixed before they get to the point where they can be transcribed. And the reason I want you to think of it this way is because every virus has to make a protein, at least one protein, before it can do anything else. And that's why you have to make an mRNA. And that'll become clearer a bit later, and also on Wednesday when we talk about DNA synthesis. Now here at the bottom of this slide, which viral genomes do not need conversion or yeah, conversion is the word I'm using. Can anyone remember one, the name of one virus that doesn't, whose genome doesn't have to be converted to make mRNA? Herpes, how about another big one? Adenovirus, yeah, all those pox viruses, those are the only ones we've talked about, okay? They don't have to be converted, these do. So keep that in mind, we'll come back to it. Let's look at the process of transcription. It's got multiple steps. And we're going to go through each one. At the top is our double-stranded DNA template. That's our color scheme for double-stranded DNA. Two different color blues. One is the plus and one is the minus strand. And there is a promoter in this DNA that specifies where RNA synthesis is going to begin, where transcription is going to begin. And the convention for drawing a promoter is a little red arrow. And the direction of the arrow tells you in which direction the mRNA is going to be made. Now, this is happening in the nucleus. Remember, except for those big viruses, everything's happening in the nucleus. That's all we'll talk about. It's where our cells do transcription. That's where most viruses do it. So we have a double-stranded DNA in the nucleus. Uh, the enzyme is brought to the promoter region. We'll talk about how that happens in a moment. You begin to make a transcript. It's capped. This is the cap structure, M7GPPPN. We'll talk about that today as well. You then make what's called a pre-mRNA. Most of our cellular messages and most viral messages are made as pre-mRNAs. And uh, that's because they're not polyadenylated and they have introns, intervening sequences that have to be removed by splicing. So the first RNA that's made is not actually a message. It's a pre-mRNA. A message is what ends up in the cytoplasm, processed, capped, and polyadenylated right here. But first, the enzyme makes a pre-mRNA. We're still in the nucleus. Uh, then uh, poly-A addition occurs. We'll talk about that today as well. And then the introns are removed by splicing. And then it gets out of the nucleus. In fact, as we'll see, splicing tells the cell that this mRNA should be exported. There's a mechanism in place in the nucleus so that unspliced 
messages don't get out, which is an interesting problem for viruses because it turns out that many viral uh, mRNAs are not spliced. We'll, figure, we'll see later how that comes about. So the spli and that's in fact shown here, some viral genomes in mRNA come out without being spliced. So they have a little pink left, a little bit of intron left. We'll talk about how that happens. The vast majority of mRNAs are spliced. They're exported, they're put into the cytoplasm, and then they're translated to make proteins. So the trans translation is an entire lecture we'll talk about next week. Now, the mRNAs don't live forever. They don't exist forever. They have a half-life, and some get to live longer than others, and that's determined by sequences in the RNA, particularly at the 3 prime end. but eventually they're degraded. You wouldn't want to have a message around forever. You couldn't control the protein, right? That would be bad, because some pro many proteins have to be regulated. So eventually they're degraded, and uh, we're not going to talk about that very much in this course, but it's a highly studied process. So let's start at the beginning, the initiation of transcription. The promoter on this piece of DNA is shown in the red arrow again, and it's in the middle of what's called an initiator sequence. There's an actual sequence surrounding the start site of transcription, uh, which is plus one in the scheme of this piece of DNA. Uh, and this initiator sequence specifies accurate starts. It, the enzyme can actually sense this and know where to start transcribing. But there's a whole host of other sequences around this that help specify initiation, its efficiency, and so forth. And uh, these are all labeled here. I want you to just understand that there are lots of control sequences involved in transcription. I don't want you to have to memorize any of these, but I want to explain to you what they are, because you're going to see them in pictures, and you're going to need to know what they are. Uh, upstream, about 20 to 35 base pairs upstream of the initiator is a TATA -ta sequence, T-A-T-A. -T -A, and that binds a protein in the cell called TF2D, and that helps recruit the polymerase to the initiator sequence. That, that, those two elements, the Tata sequence and the initiator, constitute the core promoter. So these are very close by. And then can be anywhere from 100 to 500 bases upstream. You have local regulatory sequences. Now remember, the DNA is blue, and all these other colors are sequences that are involved in regulation of transcription. They bind other proteins that regulate transcription. Some of them are local regulatory sequences, again, one to 500 bases. And together, the core and the local constitute what's called officially a promoter. So when I talk about a promoter, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, then we have distant regulatory sequences, which include enhancers and silencers. These, as the words say, either enhance transcription or silence it, but they work at a distance. Uh, they can be 100 to 10,000 bases away and still regulate transcription. So those, all of this, the distance sequences, the local, the core promoter, all of this is the transcriptional control region. So this is all important for regulating transcription. Now you can get basal transcription unregulated with just a core promoter. You don't need very much. So if you're building a plasmid and you want to make a protein, you can just stick a core promoter in and it will fire off mRNA at a high level, and you'll get what you need. But in cells, there's all sorts of regulation because you need to make mRNAs at different times, at different levels, and so forth, and viruses do the same thing. So they employ a lot of these. In fact, here is a slide comparing three different viral promoters or transcriptional control regions. We're going from plus one, the promoter, uh, the uh, transcription initiation site with the red arrow, uh, about 100 base pairs away. So these are the local sequences. This is the core promoter. On the top, we have adenovirus. And you know these viruses, many of them have multiple promoters in their genomes. As you will see, it gets to be quite a chore to regulate all of these and make sure they fire at the right time and so forth. So this is one of adenovirus called the major late promoter. And you see the word late right away. You, you're thinking, does this have to do with the infectious cycle? Yeah, now in transcription, we're going to start talking about early and middle and late phases, and mRNAs of different sorts are made at different times. So this promoter is active late in adenovirus infection. In fact, today we're going to talk about how it gets to be working only late. And you can see it's different from the SV40 early promoter. And in fact, the SV40 early promoter has three distinct start sites, as shown by the three arrows. And at the bottom is the adenovirus early promoter. And again, a number of different start sites. And key here, all the other binding sites for regulatory proteins with names like CPF, USF1, SPL, 
E2F. Don't worry about it. Don't memorize. Just know that these are transcriptional regulatory proteins that bind specific sequences and help regulate transcription. They're all different. And within a virus, you can see they are very different as well. And so are our eukaryotic promoters. They're all quite different depending on the gene. So here's what an initiation complex looks like at the very start of transcription. We have a piece of DNA, double-stranded, of course. And there in the red arrow is our transcription initiation start site. And underneath it is uh, the, uh, the, the region that specifies accurate start. And then just to the left of that would be the Tata box. You can't see it here. But there's TF2D. The big white protein in the back there, that's binding the Tata sequence. And you see there are a whole bunch of other proteins here with names, TBP, TF2E, TF2A. These are all originally isolated as fractions from a column. That's why they called them this. Now we know what they do, but uh, they didn't change the name. Here's RNA polymerase II in the back here. So this forms a complex with all these proteins. Pol2 on its own is not great at coming to promoters, but together with all these other proteins, it does very well. And that initiates transcription. But in, in addition, there are other proteins that bind those different colored boxes, which are not shown here, which would also regulate the efficiency of initiation. So this is the core promoter. And other things can help uh, raise it up or lower it. Now, here is showing you how an enhancer works. These enhancer sequences shown in orange can be up to 10,000 base pairs away. How do they enhance? Uh, transcription. Well, there are proteins that bind those enhancers, and then those proteins in turn bind uh, the initiation complex. You can see them making interactions with some of the core proteins, and it helps to stabilize them at the initiator. The DNA is obviously folding around. That's why they can work at a distance. And again, this is an enhancer, so it enhances initiation. You can also have silencers whose presence dampens initiation whenever that is necessary. So this happens with our genes, happens with viral genes as well. Now, uh, remember, we have an RNA polymerase. We have these accessory TF proteins. And then we have a whole bunch of other proteins that regulate transcription. Some of them uh, are sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. They can be viral. They can be cellular. What the name suggests is that these are proteins that recognize sequences on the DNA. And in fact, those different colors on the DNAs I've already shown you are the binding sites for these sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. We'll see lots of examples of how they're working today. But tr transcription can also be regulated by proteins that do not bind DNA directly. Uh, these are called coactivating molecules. They do modulate transcription, often by affecting the nature of the template. We'll look at an example of that today. And I'm telling you this because there are viral proteins that are coactivators that do this. And many of these modulate the structure of nucleosomes. You should know, of course, that DNA in our nucleus is wrapped up in higher order structures. The DNA here is shown in blue. Uh, it's wrapped around proteins. Uh, and the whole structure is, is called a nucleosome. And there are many, many nucleosome units in DNA. And depending on how tight or how loose the DNA is wrapped around the nucleosome will regulate transcription. If it's too tight, the polymerase can't access it transcription will be shut off. And there are just amazing ways that the, the structure of nucleosomes can be uh, arranged tight or loose to regulate transcription. And some of these coactivating molecules actually modulate this structure. Here is an example of a sequence-specific DNA binding protein. Again, one of those proteins that binds a specific part of the DNA, often pretty close to the promoter. Uh, so they're DNA binding proteins. And these proteins have a modular structure. They have a DNA binding domain here at the end terminus. And this is what interacts with the DNA. They're often dimers. And so they have a sequence in the middle that's, that specifies uh, dimer formation. It's typically a leucine zipper. And that's how the protein, the two subunits, can interact. And then it has an activation domain. And that typically interacts with either the polymerase directly or another protein that is, in turn, acting with the polymerase. So these are sequence-specific DNA binding proteins that uh, modulate transcription. They can be cellular or they can be viral. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of, of both uh, sequence-specific DNA binding proteins and coactivator proteins in regulating gene expression. Now, this is the first time we're going to see this scheme. It's going to come back 
uh, later today, and we're going to also talk about it when we talk about viruses causing cancers. It's really a really interesting story, and it's an amazing story. But let's start with um, <clears throat> this fundamental observation that <clears throat> transcription, early transcription of adenovirus genes requires a transcription, a DNA binding protein in the cell called E2F. Okay, it was originally identified as being required for adenovirus, the early region two genes. So it was called early two factor for DNA binding factor. And then we realized that it's important for a lot of cell genes as well. So E2F is present in the cell. And in order for adenovirus E2 transcription to occur, and this will become clearer in a moment when I show you a picture, uh, these E2Fs have to bind adenovirus promoters in the adenovirus genome. The problem is, uh, well, first of all, E2F is present as a dimer, a heterodimer, with another protein in the cell called DP1. Um, but um, normally, uh, this dimer, if it's bound to an E2F site, so we have E2F in pink, is bound to a third protein called RB. Some of you may know what RB stands for, retinoblastoma. This was discovered in kids that have uh, eye tumors, really amazing protein. So retinoblastoma protein is in orange. It binds uh, E2F DP1 complex, and it inhibits transcription. In fact, it stimulates histone deacetylase activity. This removes acetyl groups from the histones that DNA is wrapped around, and this makes the DNA wrap more tightly around, and it inhibits transcription. So histone deacetylation inhibits transcription. In fact, the presence of RB uh, enhances HDAC activity, so it's inhibiting transcription from this E2 promoter. That's not good for adenovirus, right? Because these are adenovirus promoters, uh, not going to fire unless uh, it can get these HDAC activities out of the way. So as soon as the virus infects the cell, remember every double-stranded DNA virus, the first thing that happens, it makes an mRNA. First mRNA is made, encodes a protein called E1A. Early region 1A, but early is the key. This promoter, this viral promoter, is recognized by the cell. It makes a protein called E1A. And what does E1A do? You can, this is just beautiful. It binds RB, pulls it away from E2F, and now HDAC activity is gone. The promoter works. And if this is a viral promoter, then the transcriptional program can proceed. So here's an example of both sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, E2F, and RB, which is acting to modulate histone deacetylase activity and thereby controlling the promoter. So this is really important for a number of reasons. It, it illustrates this principle of both DNA binding and non-DNA binding regulators. Uh, it shows you how the virus has to make this protein before it can do anything else, because it needs this transcription factor, E2F. And to do that, it needs to, be, to infect the cell and immediately make, a, immediately make an mRNA that can encode a protein E1A that will antagonize RB activity. Now, looking forward about a week, try and remember this, because this is going to come back when we talk about cell growth control and uh, causing viruses causing cancer. E2, E1A, and RB, remember that. <clears throat> All right, let's take a question here. What is the first biosynthetic event that occurs in cells infected with double-stranded DNA viruses? Membrane infusion, transcription, DNA replication, protein synthesis, or all of the above? The answer, of course, is B, transcription, which most of you got. It's, uh, I know it's a little confusing because I told you those other genomes have to be repaired, right? And they are biosynthetic events to repair, but you have to just remember this, that you have to first get the double-stranded DNA, and that double-stranded DNA, that's why I put double-stranded DNA viruses in the title, then has to be transcribed to make an mRNA. Now let's look at different strategies. We can divide viruses into different categories depending on how they go about making mRNA from the simple to the complicated. So right there on the top, some retroviruses. We call them simple retroviruses. You'll see next time, uh, next week, what we mean by that. This means retroviruses with simple genomes that just encode a few proteins. 
I would never call them any virus simple, right? They're not. Um, these viruses for transcription, the origin of the transcriptional components, everything from the host. So retroviruses, to make mRNA, all the enzymes are host-derived. And when we talk about retrovirus, you'll see why that is. It's essentially because the retroviral genome integrates as a double-stranded DNA copy into the host cell genome, and it uses our machinery. Then we have some viruses where you have one viral protein only, just one, plus the rest comes from the host that is involved in transcription. So the RNA polymerase, of course, uh, and many other proteins needed for RNA synthesis like we just saw. And the virus contributes one. And you'll see uh, today how that one protein works. And this includes complex retroviruses. They have complicated genomes that make a lot of proteins. Parvoviruses, and papilloma, and polyomaviruses. And then we get more complicated, bigger genomes, uh, the, the more than one viral protein plus the host components uh, are involved. Adenoviruses and herpes viruses, we'll talk today about uh, the proteins that are involved there. And then we have the ones that are all viral. As I told you, the viruses that replicate in the cytoplasm, pox viruses, the giant viruses, all the transcriptional machinery is coming uh, from the host cell. One distinguishing factor from between transcription and what we talked about last week, RNA-dependent RNA synthesis, is that there is a great deal of temporal regulation of transcription. And a lot of interesting schemes have evolved to do that. Now, you may say, why, why do we do this? And one major factor is that um, all, vir all DNA viruses need to make at least one protein in order to replicate their genomes. And as you saw with RNA viruses, some of the negative strand RNA viruses come in with a polymerase ready to replicate its genome. So there's very, there are a lot of differences here. So DNA viruses have to coordinate the, num the proteins that are made. They can't make everything at once, and therefore they have evolved a number of schemes. So here are two that pretty much encompass everything. Um, on the top is a scheme of what we call positive autoregulation. All right, so what happens here is we have a viral DNA comes into the cell, and as it goes into the nucleus, has a promoter shown there, in yellow uh, with the tr transcription initiation to the right, and that gene gets transcribed by the cellular transcription machinery to make a viral mRNA, which is translated to a protein. Protein then goes back and binds to the promoter region of the viral genome, and now you make a lot more of the mRNA. So the viral protein plus cellular components the cellular components originally transcribed that mRNA, but when you make this viral protein X, you get much more uh, synthesis of viral mRNA. So we call that a positive autoregulatory loop. All right, so again, this protein is activating, is serving as an activator uh, of the promoter. There can also be negative loops, and we're going to see some examples of that today. There are ways that viral proteins can negatively regulate transcription. It may be that you only need a protein during a certain part of the infectious cycle, so you, at some point you negatively regulate it, so positive or negatively regulate it. Now, as we get into the more complicated viral genomes, you'll see what we call cascade regulation, which is in Part B. So we have a viral DNA comes into a cell. A promoter is recognized by the cellular components. Uh, it gives rise to a viral mRNA, which is translated to a protein. And then that protein activates a second promoter downstream or away from the original promoter. And that second promoter would not be transcribed uh, in the early parts of the infectious cycle because protein X isn't present. So it's not recognized by cellular promoters until protein X is made, uh, sorry, it is not recognized by the cellular machinery until protein X is made, and then uh, gene Y can be made into an mRNA, and you can get uh, proteins made as well. And this can go up to three or four steps, as you will see when we talk about specific examples. So obvious, it's obvious, I think, why we call it cascade regulation. You make one protein in order to make the second and in order to make the third. Now. If you're wondering why you have to do this, it's because you want to make the proteins that are needed when you need them. And a big limitation in DNA viruses is DNA replication. DNA replication typically occurs later in infection because the virus has to make proteins. 
to initiate DNA replication. There's no point in making capsid proteins during the first hour of infection if you can't use them for another six hours, right? It would probably get degraded anyway. So that's in part why we uh, regulate, or why virus transcription is regulated. So I want to go through three examples of how viral, three different viruses, how transcription is regulated from simple to intermediate to more complicated. And this will illustrate all the principles I've told you so far. So the first one is SV40, a polyomavirus, uh, schematized in the upper right. We've talked about the structure of this as an icosahedral virus with rather simple construction. It's a double-stranded circular DNA genome shown here at the bottom, all right? And this is unusual, this virus, by the way, because the um, genome in the virus particle is actually nucleosomed. It's wrapped around a nucleosome, which it's chromatinized, we say, uh, which is not the case for most uh, viral DNAs. They do get chromatinized when they enter the nucleus, but very few of them are actually uh, wrapped around nucleosomes in the virus particles. So if you look closely at that image, that's, that's why it looks that way. And in subsequent figures, it's the same. So this is a rather simple uh, virus in terms of transcriptional programs. Now at the top is a timeline of what happens during infection. So infection starts at the left, and then we go through an early and a late phase. So for this virus, there are just two phases during the cycle, and these are defined by transcription, mainly. Early, there are early mRNAs that are made, and there are late mRNAs that are made. And in fact, on the viral genome, it's all very neatly done. Uh, there's a single point up at the top here at 12 o'clock where transcription begins. The early uh, mRNAs are transcribed to the left, and the late mRNAs are transcribed to the right. There are two different promoters that work in each direction. And again, we have early and late phases because we can control by regulating the mRNAs that are made what kind of proteins are made. So early proteins, you could probably guess, are not going to encode early mRNAs, are not going to encode capsid proteins because we don't need them yet. Now, when SV40 first infects a cell and the DNA gets in the nucleus, the first, it has to make at least one mRNA, right? It's a double-stranded DNA virus. One mRNA has to be made, and that mRNA encodes for a protein called large T. T stands for tumor, because that's how it was first discovered, as you'll see next week. Large T antigen is the first protein uh, that is made. So if you look at this transcriptional map here, this early mRNA would be made, and it encodes large T antigen. Why do we need, make large T? <laughs> large T is an amazing protein. It's been called the best studied protein on the planet. And besides, uh, it, it's, it's an absolutely essential for DNA replication. So these green arrows here uh, show the, the purple bar in this timeline uh, means the onset of viral DNA synthesis. And at large T is absolutely required for that. We'll talk about that on Wednesday. It's actually an origin binding protein. Origin or ORI is the site where DNA replication begins. And T antigen is absolutely essential for that. So you can't replicate your DNA until you make T antigen. So that's the early phase of infection. You have to make enough T antigen in order to stimulate uh, our, uh, DNA replication. And then, as soon as DNA replication begins, you move into the late phase. That's really the definition of late phases in all these viruses, when DNA replication begins. So large T um, stimulates viral DNA synthesis because it binds to the origin. Uh, the late promoter is anti-repressed. So early in infection, the late promoter, which goes to the right on this circle, is repressed. And I'll show you the mechanism of that in a moment on the next slide. Um, and in addition, large T, when it reaches high enough level, represses early region mRNA synthesis. So it represses its own synthesis. When you have enough in the cell, it acts in a negative autoregulatory fashion. It inhibits its own promoter because you don't need infinite amounts of T, you just need enough to get the system going, and it represses itself. So this is a very interesting multifunctional protein. Again, so L large T made early stimulates DNA synthesis, inhibits its own synthesis, and then we enter into the late phase. So the late phase uh, is, is made possible by large T, which stimulates DNA synthesis. And viral DNA synthesis is also involved in lifting the repression of the late promoters. So early in infection, the late promoters are not active. 
they're not making mRNA. What's the mechanism of that? I'll show you that now on this slide. So here is the late promoter here shown on the top. It's the double-stranded DNA with uh, several DNA binding protein uh, elements there. And you can see the initiation site of RNA synthesis is the red arrow. Now, uh, this, in the early phase of infection, the late promoter is inactive. And that's because uh, all the, 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 the initiator site and all the other binding sites are bound up by a cellular protein called IBP, or initiator binding protein. So this is a cellular protein that has uh, repressive roles in the cell. And it happens to bind up all the promoter elements in the late promoter. And that's why early in SV40 infection, the late promoter is silent, because the promoter is all bound up by these inhibitors. So it's repressed. Now remember, in the early phase, T antigen is made. T antigen allows DNA synthesis to occur. So then in the late phase of infection shown here, you start to accumulate DNA templates. At the same time, the concentration of IBP does not change in the cell. It remains the same. So the more DNA templates you make, eventually you dilute out all the IBB, IBP proteins, and you have eventually templates which are not bound by IBP, like this one on the lower right, and then the late promoter gets activated. And then you have transcription shown by the, the green mRNA. So this is why DNA synthesis acts as an anti-repressor for the late promoter, because it makes lots of templates, titrates out the IBP, which is a repressor, and now the promoter becomes active. And remember, the early promoter is being shut down by T antigen, while this late one is being activated. We don't need T antigen anymore. So that's how that works. So let's take an overview of an SV40 infected cell to put all this into perspective. We have SV40 binding. Uh, the particles are taken up. The DNA is delivered to the nucleus. You can see there it's nucleosomed. It's wrapped up all around chromatin. First thing that happens, early phase, an mRNA is made. That's step six there. That mRNA gets shunted out into the cytoplasm, it's translated, and it makes large T antigen. That's the early phase, which is denoted by this dotted line here. T antigen has to get back in the nucleus, has a nuclear localization signal that does that. Uh, it gets into the nucleus. It can stimulate DNA replication. So it can bind to the origin, and as soon as the DNA begins to replicate, and you can see in step 10 here, there are now two daughter molecules. So we're now officially in the late phase, defined by the onset of DNA replication. The, um, the DNA replication eventually uh, allows the late promoter uh, to be activated, and the late mRNAs are made, they're exported, and as you might guess, they encode capsid proteins. BP1, 2, 3, and 4 are all capsid proteins. As the DNA is replicating in the nucleus, capsid proteins are imported. Uh, they package the newly made DNAs and eventually leave the cell. So this is a very nice, simple scheme. It's a protein with a relatively small genome. Uh, it doesn't encode a polymerase or an RNA, a DNA or RNA polymerase. It has one protein that's needed to kick the, the infectious cycle. So it's a really nice illustration of the idea that you have to make this single protein, in order to get DNA replication to occur. And that's how it's regulated. It's pretty straightforward, but it works. And, and there are lots of viruses like this. The papillomaviruses that cause warts and cancers in humans are similar viruses. We'll talk a little bit more about those later when we talk about transformation. Now let's look at a more complicated scheme, adenovirus. The adenogenome is bigger. Polyomavirus was about 8 kb. Adenovirus 35 to 40 kb of DNA. So it can do more. And so adenoviruses have three phases, if you will. There are three viral proteins uh, and, th and DNA synthesis that governs the transition from one phase to another. As soon as the adenoviral DNA gets into a cell, it has to make at least one protein. And that protein, as I mentioned before, is made from the immediate early region of the genome, and the protein's called E1A. Remember, E1A binds RB and frees up E2F, and E2F is needed for the transcription of the early genes, the E genes. Without E1A, the E 
the early genes would never be transcribed because they're not, uh, they're not, we don't have free E2F in the cell. So that's why this virus has an additional step because its, its early region promoters have evolved to require this E2F and to free that up requires the synthesis of uh, E1A. So E1A activates the early genes. Uh, among the products of the early region is a protein called E2, which like T antigen is required for viral DNA synthesis. And the, the DNA synthesis is shown by the purple bar there. And of course, once you start replicating DNA, you go into L phase of, of uh, replication. Uh, and that starts transcription from what's called the late promoter. So we have immediate early, early and late promoters for adenovirus. Uh, so DNA replication relieves promoter occlusion, the late promoter, just similar to what we discussed for SV40 by removing uh, repressors. And another early protein, 4A2, is also need for, needed for activation of late promoters as well. So a little bit more complexity. 4A, 4A2 enhances late gene transcription. All right. And again, the, all this is needed. You can explain why you need all this. First of all, you want to keep uh, late transcription till after DNA synthesis occurs, because most of the late genes have structural components encoded in that. And so what you do is you make an E2 protein, and that sort of like, acts like T antigen and kickstarts DNA replication. But in this case, for adeno, you can't make E2 until you make E1A to free up the transcription factor, E2F, that's needed by E2. So it all makes perfect sense. So uh, this is the adenovirus genome, a double-stranded DNA, linear, about 35 to 40 kilobases long. And <clears throat> I, want, I show you this to illustrate these three phases of transcription and how complicated they can be. First, the E1 region, the early region 1 that gives rise to the E1A protein that's needed to free up E2F. That's shown here on the left. So the transcription of e, E1A starts here. It's a very short transcriptional unit. Uh, and then, of course, E1A allows transcription from the E2, the early 2 region. And that begins uh, right down here but it's from the other strand, so now this is more complicated. We're getting uh, multiple transcription units. So this is all one uh, long transcription unit. And uh, this mRNA looks long, but it's going to get processed by splicing. It encodes a DNA binding protein uh, and a polymerase, a DNA polymerase. And that's going to get the genome replicated. And then, of course, 4A2 is encoded in here. 4A2 is needed to get the late region promoter active, which is, again, on the other strand. This is the major late promoter. Makes a huge transcript. And we're going to talk about how that gets made and processed. And you can see some of the proteins encoded are the capsid proteins, hexon and penton base, core proteins, which go inside the capsid, uh, the fiber protein, the, 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 uh, the fiber sticking out of the capsid. Those are all late encoded by late mRNAs. That's why we want to make them at the end, because only when the E2 region is transcribed do we get DNA replication. And again, you don't want to make capsid proteins till you've made uh, some DNA. So that's an, a nice example of how these transcriptional units are organized. And presumably, they're organized in a way to maximize their control. Great example of a cascade. So here it is shown on the replication cycle of adenovirus binding uh, to cell surface, and we've talked about how the virus gets in, and eventually the DNA gets into the nucleus. First thing that happens, first biosynthetic event, production of an mRNA that gets exported and translated to E1A. E1A comes back in the nucleus, frees up E2F, so that the second phase of early E2 region transcription can begin. Those mRNAs go out and are translated to components needed for DNA replication, the polymerase, DNA binding protein, et cetera. So those go back in the nucleus and catalyze DNA replication, which is shown down here. And that's finally the late phase of replication. Uh, and now you get uh, activation of the late promoter, which is both by anti-repression caused by DNA synthesis and 4A2 protein, shown here. Those mRNAs go out, are, are translated to the structural proteins, and they have to go back in the nucleus, of course, to make new virus particles. So three phases. And all, again, temporally regulated to maximize what proteins are made when. 
Finally, the last example of these cascades is herpes virus. It's really like adeno, but just a little bit of complexity added in. All right? um, here's the timeline of herpes virus infection. And the immediate, it also encodes immediate early, early, and late mRNAs. And the late, again, is defined by onset of DNA replication. The immediate early promoter, however, doesn't work in a cell. It needs, it needs a viral protein. So remember, adenovirus brought in, adenovirus genome could be transcribed to make uh, e, E1A, which was needed for E2 synthesis, but herpes doesn't do that. Rather, what herpes does is brings in in the capsid a protein. It's packaged in what's called the tegument between the capsid and the membrane, all these little proteins. One of them is a protein called VP16. It's a transcriptional activator of viral promoters because the cell doesn't recognize it. And so this gets into the nucleus, activates immediate early transcription. And some of the proteins that are made include ICP0, which then turns on early region transcription. And that, of course, leads to the production of replication proteins, which activate DNA replication. And then uh, that activates late transcription. We think, again, that DNA replication is an anti-repressor, just like we've talked about before. And there are also proteins, early proteins, that are needed uh, for, for DNA synthesis, shown by the green arrow here. And, and very much like T-antigen, ICP4, an early protein, represses immediate early synthesis because you don't need it after a certain point in the replication cycle. So this is very much like adenovirus, except that a virus brings in VP16, which I think is worthy of, of having a separate mention. But very much everything else is similar in the, in the cascade regulation. In the end, it's all because you have coordinated production of DNA genomes and structural proteins. So that's herpes virus. So let's take a look at that overview. Virus, again, is an envelope virus with a capsid inside, nucleocapsid, and between the envelope and the capsid is, is all these proteins, including VP16. Um, the virus fuses at the plasma membrane. The capsid travels down to the nucleus. DNA gets into the nucleus. And VP16 is also coming out on fusion. That can get into the nucleus. It's pretty small. It can get right through the pores. And that will stimulate transcription of the immediate early genes. And you get that first IE message, which gets exported and made into immediate early proteins which of course are needed uh, for early proteins, early mRNA transcription. They have to get back in the nucleus. They stimulate the second set of uh, transcription. Those get back in and they stimulate uh, DNA replication. Um, and these immediate early and early and late are called alpha, beta, and gamma. They're just given different names. And the onset of DNA replication is the late phase, of course, that activates the late promoter, uh, which encodes, which produces mRNAs that encode structural proteins. And the newly synthesized DNAs are encapsidated in the nucleus, and then uh, they leave the nucleus by a series of budding events that we'll talk about later. So again, a nice example of a cascade regulation. All right, next question is, adenovirus E1A protein stimulating the expression of adeno E2 protein, which then stimulates expression of adenovirus 4A2, and L4 protein is an example of negative autoregulatory loop, repression of gene expression, cascade regulation, or dimerization? The answer, of course, is C. It's cascade regulation. One activates another, activates another. It's not a negative loop, although it may involve shutting off of early or immediate early genes. The whole, the whole concept is a cascade regulation. Now, let's go back to transcription and look at how the mRNA is made and modified. And the first thing I want to talk about a bit is the cap at the 5' end, which we introduced last time and we didn't really talk about. So here in our scheme of transcription, uh, the cap, is, you can see, is added very early on and stays with the mRNA until the mature mRNA here. You see a 5' cap. It's always shown as a little blue box. And at the right, expanded is what the cap actually looks like chemically. So this is the very five prime end of the mRNA. The first base is shown here, base one in red. And the second base here in blue. The cap is actually a G residue, which is linked to the first base by a five prime, five prime linkage. As you know, the bases, the nucleoside, 
Uh, monophosphates are linked via a three prime to five prime linkage with one phosphate in between, but a cap is different. There are three phosphates and there's a five to five prime linkage. In addition, specific residues are methylated. You can see in yellow a methyl uh, there on the, on the G, a methyl on the first base, and a methyl on the second base. And these methyls are not found elsewhere. They're important for the function of the cap. And as we'll see, the cap has a big role in translation, making messages efficiently translated, but it has a lot of other functions as well. It can also regulate the stability of a message, for example. How's the cap added? So at the top is our DNA template for transcription, the red arrow, the initiation site. The RNA polymerase has bound and is starting to make mRNA. We have about 20 to 30, after about 20 to 30 nucleotides of mRNA are made, uh, then the capping enzyme, which is a separate enzyme, comes and joins the RNA polymerase, which is shown in the third line here. The capping enzyme is recruited when the polymerase gets phosphorylated. As you can see by the two Ps there, it's the C-terminal domain of the polymerase. And then, at that point, the cap is added. So, it's, the cap isn't added at the very beginning of transcription. It's added only after 20 to 30 bases. I think part of the reason for this is that a lot of initiations are aborted. The, the, the polymerase falls off, and you have small pieces of RNA made, and only when it's clear that transcription is going to continue is the cap added. So that's the cap. The other modification of an mRNA, of course, is the poly-A tail, which we talked about last time in terms of RNA-dependent RNA synthesis. It's a bit different for DNA. So here again on the left is our scheme of the production of mRNAs, and you can see the poly-A tail at the three prime end of the mature mRNA in the cytoplasm. That's also added in the nucleus. What happens is, as the mRNA is being produced, here at the top right is the pre-mRNA, there is a signal uh, in the DNA called the poly-A addition site, typically AAUAAA. The polymerase will go by it, continues making mRNA. You can see it's gone way past the poly-A addition site. It's a separate protein in the cell called cleavage and polyadenylation splicing factor, CPSF, which recognizes uh, the AAUAAA as a polyadenylation sequence, and then together with a variety of other cellular proteins, induces the cleavage just downstream of that site, where the line is shown there. You get cleavage, and then another enzyme, poly A polymerase, comes in and adds uh, 200 A's to the end. So it's not templated, like it is for some RNA viruses, uh, and it happens post-transcriptionally. After the RNA is made, the three prime end is cleaved off, and the poly A's are added just downstream of that poly A addition site. You get about 200 A's at the three prime end, again, which are important for stability, translatability, and so forth. So let's compare polyadenylation for DNA viruses. The enzyme that adds poly A uh, is a cellular enzyme. And as I've just told you, it occurs by cleavage of pre-mRNA at the poly A addition site, followed by polyadenylation. Now, for RNA viruses, polyadenylation is different depending on the virus. For flu and VSV, we saw how it's caused by reiterative copying at stretches of U in the template. So the U, there's a short stretch of U, and the polymerase gets stuck and keeps churning out A's. But for polio and alpha viruses, uh, the polyadenylation is actually copying an encoded stretch of U. If the poly A is 200 bases long, there's a 200 base stretch of U in the genome. So it's encoded in the genome. So the DNA viruses resemble flu and VSV in that the poly A is not encoded. <clears throat> the other modification, it's a really important one, is splicing. And we splicing of mRNAs, which we now occurs, know occurs in all organisms, was discovered in virus-infected cells. Because back then, in the 70s, viruses were the only organisms that you could purify genomes and mRNAs in biochemical quantities so that you could do these kinds of studies. So here's the adenovirus genome uh, double-stranded DNA. And a number of investigators, both at MIT and at Cold Spring Harbor, were trying to map where the mRNAs were on the viral genome. They wanted to know where the coding regions were. And they were looking at the mRNA encoding the hexon, which is a major structural component uh, of the virus particle. And it, they always found that the, the mRNA was way bigger than the actual 
protein in the final mRNA itself, what the coding region in the genome for hexon seemed to be way longer than the actual mRNA and the protein. So what they did was an experiment using electron microscopy, where they took the adenovirus DNA, they purified it, and then they purified the mRNA for the hexon. They hybridized them, so they melted the DNA to take apart the strands, and then they hybridized the mRNA, and they looked at it on an electron microscope to see the RNA and the DNA, how they were hybridizing. And on the right is the actual, is a drawing of the actual data from the paper, uh, which is referenced in the textbook. Uh, and I've redrawn it here for simplicity. What they found is that the adenovirus mRNA, shown in green here, when it hybridizes to the DNA, the DNA makes all these loops. Apparently, there were parts of the, uh, the hexon coding region that were removed to make the final mRNA. And in particular, we could see three loops uh, in the hexon mRNA, and those correspond to the same colors on the right. The, the actual EM is a little confusing, so I've redrawn it. And the three loops uh, correspond to intervening sequences, or introns, now we call them, that were removed. So here at the, bo at the bottom is the uh, actual coding region for the hexon uh, on the viral DNA. And the actual mRNA, the body of the hexon in green here, uh, corresponds to what's shown in this diagram. But there are three loops, A, B, and C, shown in blue, orange, and red, which are removed by splicing, and that's why they're looped out when the DNA is hybridized to the mRNA. So the actual uh, mRNA in the end consists of the hexon body, and then these three short black sequences, which are put together by splicing, they're called the tripartite leader because there are three of them, and they are actually a non-coding region that are important for translation. So splicing was discovered in adenovirus. It was then found in pretty much every virus. We even see it in some RNA viruses, as I said last time. All cellular mRNAs are spliced as well. It's an important uh, feature in many, many genomes, and uh, the people who discovered this got the Nobel Prize about five years ago for this. So, as you know, as from what I've told you, there are mRNAs, pre-mRNAs, that have intervening sequences that have to be spliced out. So people started sequencing every uh, intervening sequence they could find, and eventually they came to a consensus of what a pre-mRNA looks like. So at the top, just by looking at all the sequences of pre-mRNAs in the database, you can see that there are some very highly conserved regions. First of all, here's uh, the first exon, the intervening sequence or intron right here in pink, and then on the right is the second exon. These two exons, of course, are gonna be spliced together to make the mature mRNA. But you can see there's some very conserved nucleotides. What, look at this A here is 100% conserved, and all the mRNAs you look at, and all the introns, 100% conserved. Uh, the bases at the five prime end of the intron, the three prime end of the intron, 100% conserved, and many of these others are highly conserved as well. It turns out that's because of how this uh, splicing event occurs. The way this uh, intron is removed, and this goes for both viral and cellular mRNAs, is that uh, this A, the hydroxyl of this A, attacks the phosphate right at the uh, five prime splice site of exon one. It causes a transesterification reaction, and then there's, that liberates the, the three prime hydroxyl from the end of that exon. That hydroxyl then does a second transesterification on the five prime exon sequence right there, and you get a spliced product and an excised intron in the form of a lariat. It looks like one of those cowboy uh, ropes that you would uh, rope cattle with, so they called it a, a lariat intron. These are, these are RNAs that you can actually uh, see in infected cells. This whole reaction occurs in a structure in the cell called the spliceosome. Now, if you've had uh, elementary biochemistry and biology, you should know this, but I want to remind you because uh, it leads to an important thing I'm going to tell you in a moment. So here's our pre-mRNA up at the top with the intron in pink. The spliceosome is a very large complex of proteins and RNAs. Uh, and the RNAs are shown here in different colors, U1 and U2, and the proteins are just shown as outlines. The function of the RNAs is actually twofold. First of all, they hybridize to very specific sequences at the intron-exon border, and they hold the pre-RNA in place. And then, uh, once they do that, the actual catalysis, where that A attacks the five-prime exon site, that's all done by RNA. 
RNA is the catalyst, catalyst uh, in this spliceosome. And it's actually the, the proteins just serve to make it a platform for the splicing to occur. But all the uh, enzymatic reactions are catalyzed by RNA. And we, we call this ribozyme. That was discovered a number of years ago. And again, uh, got the Nobel Prize for those who discovered this. The fact that RNA is the catalyst and is probably a remnant of the RNA world before uh, there were proteins. So the point is that this spliceosome protein RNA complex uh, holds the pre-mRNA and the RNAs carry out the catalysis to break these bonds, release the lariat intron shown at the left in red, and produce the mature mRNA in the sequence of events that I just told you. Now, in terms of uh, viruses, this is very beneficial because you can make lots of different proteins by what we call alternative splicing. So here on the left in panel A, we have a gene, a pre-mRNA with two introns. Uh, three exons, two introns. If we take all the introns out, that's called constitutive splicing, we get a final mRNA with one, two, three. That's straightforward. But we can also do alternative splicing in a variety of ways. We could skip exons. We could make an mRNA with one, two, three, or with one and three. We remove number two. That'll make a different protein. We can have alternative five prime splice sites. Sometimes one is used to, to join to the uh, three prime Exxon, sometimes the second one is used. You get different proteins by that. You can also have alternative three prime splice sites. So they can be used sometimes one and sometimes the other. And they're regulated by specific proteins uh, that bind to them. So you can see this enormously expands the coding capacity, not only of our genome, but of small viruses that don't have a lot of room to put lots of genes in them. So here's an example of adenovirus. This is the major late mRNA that last one that encodes all the structural proteins. It's made as a huge uh, mRNA, but there are alternative polyadenylation sites. The, the longest mRNA is shown at the bottom of this nested set here. And that is made when polyadenylation occurs at this L5 site. But you can also polyadenylate at L4, L3, L2, and L1. So you can make a nested set of mRNAs. Then these can be alternatively spliced in a variety of ways, different three prime splice sites, for example, alternatives, exon shuffling, and that gives you the final mRNAs shown on the left here and on the right, encoding the structural proteins. So a combination of uh, alternative polyadenylation and alternative splicing gives you enormous uh, coding capacity from a single transcript. And so that's why this is good for viruses. Now, all of this is regulated. It just doesn't happen randomly. Well, alternative polyadenylation, the alternative splicing is regulated, and there are viral proteins that participate. I don't want to go into that because it's, we don't have the time, but viruses can determine which proteins are made uh, when. All right, our last question is, which statement about polyadenylation of DNA virus mRNA is correct? It always occurs in the cytoplasm. It occurs after cleavage of pre-mRNA. Poly A is added at the five prime end of pre-mRNA. It is specified by a stretch of U residues in the template. All right, the answer is B, of course. It occurs after cleavage of pre-mRNA. It's not added at the five prime end, it's added at the three prime end. It's not specified by U. This is a DNA virus. It is specified by U in some RNA viruses, though. The key part about splicing is that this whole process involving the spliceosome, the RNA protein complex, marks processed mRNA for export. Cell, the cell does not want to export unspliced RNAs. That wouldn't be good. They can't be translated. They have a big intervening sequence. And remember, the nucleus has a marvelous specific import and export machinery. And so the cell has evolved a way to figure out which mRNAs have been spliced. And here's how it works. Here's at the top is our pre-mRNA. We have an intron there with the stripes. It has to be removed. And all these proteins uh, binding to the RNA are part of the spliceosome. They are about to assemble a spliceosome. The little RNAs are going to come in and splice the mRNA. Splicing occurs in the nucleus, and you end up with the spliced mRNA. Some of the proteins involved in splicing remain bound to the mRNA. You can see in this second line here, all these proteins with funny names all involved in the spliceosome. They mark that mRNA for export. 
The cell now knows that that mRNA has been spliced because it has these splicing proteins left on it. They are recognized by components of the export pathway. The nucleus is full of proteins that can recognize things that need to be exported. They have export signals on them, and they include proteins that bind poly A, uh, UAP56, NFX1. Names are not important. The point is they recognize this message is being spliced by virtue of these proteins, and they export it out of the nucleus. So it's a beautiful system for making sure that only spliced messages get out of the nucleus. However, many viral genomes, while they are spliced, also have to be unspliced and get out of the nucleus to be part of the virus particle. So here's an example of a retrovirus. Uh, this is a retrovirus with a simple genome. Its RNA is shown at the top here. This RNA is produced by transcription of a DNA copy of the virus that's integrated into the host DNA. We'll talk about that a bit next week. The full length RNA needs to get out of the nucleus in order to be packaged into new virus particles, which happens in the cytoplasm. But at the same time, there is an intron in here, and some of these mRNAs are spliced to give rise to the envelope protein, but that spliced RNA can't be put into a virus particle. It wouldn't be infectious. So there has to be a way for these um, unspliced viral genomes to get out. So what is it? Well, it turns out that the 3 prime end of the viral RNA is a sequence shown in orange. It's called CTE, constitutive export element. Transport, not export. Constitutive transport element. What do you think that does? It binds elements of the nuclear export machinery. NFX1, NXT1, REFs, these are all proteins that are normally would be recognizing spliceosome components, but they're recognizing the RNA sequence. It has evolved to be able to bind this system. And this unspliced RNA will be exported. It's beautiful. The virus can get some exported mRNA out. It doesn't violate any rules. Uh, and the cell export system in the nucleus happily takes it out. So there are lots of examples of um, viruses uh, that have to get out unspliced RNAs. I have one more I want to tell you about because it's a little bit different. And this is for HIV, which we consider a retrovirus with a complex genome. It encodes more proteins. The retroviral genome is shown at the top. It's actually shown as a provirus. It's integrated into the host. The host is purple on either end. But here is the viral genome. And the, the, at the bottom here, just below it, are all the different proteins that are made. Lots of splicing going on in order to make these different proteins. Now, the problem is that um, splicing is great to get these proteins, but at some point you have to export an unspliced RNA to make a genome to get into new virus particles. So the unspliced RNA is shown as the first green line here. So what would normally happen in the cell, it would be spliced extensively. And one of the splice products is shown down at the lower left here. It's exported, it's spliced, so it's marked and it's exported gives rise to a protein uh, called REV, R-E-V. REV goes back in the nucleus. It has a nuclear import signal. There's a sequence at the three prime end of the viral RNA called a REV response element, R-R-E. It's a secondary structure element. It binds REV, and REV uh, will allow the export of unspliced RNAs because REV is recognized by the export machinery. In fact, REV, the presence of REV will allow export of a variety of spliced products, as well as the full length genome, even if they're not fully spliced. So those are just two examples of how you can get out um, a non-spliced mRNA. It's really important to do for these viruses because it's their genome. So I think you can see from this discussion that splicing is great for a virus. It's value added. Alternative splicing makes different mRNAs that, that encode different proteins with different functions, all from the same region of the genome. You take one 5KB gene and make, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 different proteins, obviously value added. So uh, for a small DNA genome, you expand your coding capacity. But even big viral genomes do this. It can have lots of protein uh, made as well. And it, it's also important for regulating gene expression, not just adding more proteins, but regulating expression by alternative splicing. You can turn on one form versus another different polyadenylation and so forth. So splicing plays into that as well. So what we've talked about today is transcription of DNA genomes. Uh, we've gone from 
double-stranded DNA to mRNA. That's transcription. Any DNA virus that is not double-stranded has to be first repaired to get to uh, double-stranded DNA, and then it can be transcribed. So among all the DNA configurations shown on this slide, you can see the polyoma viruses, the adenovirus, herpes viruses, the pox viruses, which you don't talk about too much, but they are the viruses replicating in the cytoplasm. All of these um, are ready to go for transcription. The other genomes, circoviruses, parvoviruses, uh, and hepatitis B virus have to be repaired first in order to make double-stranded DNA uh, for transcription. And why does transcription occur first? This is something I told you at the very beginning. The first event, the first biosynthetic event after you fix your genome and make it double-stranded DNA is transcription and the synthesis of an mRNA. Why is that? That's because replication, DNA replication, always requires at least one viral protein. So for SV40, it just needs one to kickstart viral DNA replication, but the other viruses, adeno, herpes, sometimes require many more. So that's always going to be delayed because you first have to make the protein and then the protein participates in DNA synthesis. So that is why the first event is mRNA synthesis because you can't replicate your genome without first making at least one protein. So next time we'll talk about DNA replication and we'll find out exactly what these proteins that are necess necessary, what they do for uh, DNA synthesis.